How do you read Baudrillard? The Matrix is surely the kind of film about the Matrix that the Matrix would have been able to produce, Baudrillard himself said on the film. Why was Baudrillard so critical of it? And what does this have to do with the revenge of the hyperreal? I mean, I, I guess for myself, to play Thomas Anderson, he was searching for the truth to his life. He felt that something was wrong. He felt like he was not having real contact. He was searching for something. He was searching. He felt that there was something behind the veil. You ever have that feeling where you're not sure if you're awake or still dreaming? Mm, all the time. And he was looking. So he was looking for tr Morpheus to try to, to break that veil. And I guess that that is something that um, Baudrillard spoke about sometimes, but not in searching for something, but in what got in the way. He does one chapter, I believe, on like religious icons, where the icon starts to represent God and it loses its power of a true connection to God because then you're with the icon and then you have a simulation of an icon until it becomes on the dashboard of your car. You know, a decay of meaning. Before we continue on Baudrillard's theory of simulacra, let us briefly consider the side joke of history that is Benjamin Pratton's essay, The Revenge of the Real. Pratton's book reveals what the true aim of postmodern critiques of power and meta-narrative has always been. A power grab itself and the aim to establish its own meta-narrative. The boomer materialist fantasy about total control over nature through computer simulations is ironically not the return of the real, but the final victory of the simulation and the computer model. All the materialistic threat scenarios that Pretton describes, be it COVID or climate change, are based nearly entirely on simulated forecasts. The virus, after all, is invisible. What we are witnessing is not the revenge of the real, but of the hyperreal. It is a hyperreal, produced from a radiating synthesis of combinatory models in a hyperspace without atmosphere, says Baudrillard. Or does Breton really believe and suggest that climate models and simulations about future projected infection cases correspond to reality? The fear of death has really strange consequences for some, doesn't it? Of course, I should mention that also Baudrillard unfortunately did not question the post-structuralist assumption, or should I say, the piety of his time that signifiers our words that refer only to other words and can therefore never reach out to material objects and their interrelations. That is a pretty strong assumption. Sophistic attacks such as this on language and phenomena are as old as philosophy, however. Understanding language, as they do here, as an external system of signifiers, but not as co-constitutive of human being, is subjectivism at its utmost extreme. Language is never just a system that is standing there ready to be used and abused and manipulated. Instead, language is only ever in the enactment of speaking and of writing. The absolutization of language by post-structuralism must count as another side joke of the tired old 20th century that simply doesn't want to die. The irony is that post-structuralism needs hermeneutics to engage in its critiques but that at once the claim is also that hermeneutics is not possible, that is, that repetition, and thereby coming back to the source through repetition, is not possible. Perhaps we should also mention Gratilis, one of the followers of Heraclitus, and of course, as a good follower, someone who completely misunderstood Heraclitus. Gratilis, we learn from Plato, did not even lift as much as a finger anymore towards the end of his life, because he took Heraclitus so the wrong way and so seriously that he could not name anything thinking that everything is just in flow. So the words did no longer point to anything out there in the world. We can see that again these attacks on language are as old as philosophy itself and that in fact philosophy is from its beginning an attempt to attack or counter-attack the sophists and to save and safeguard the phenomena. But let's return to the Matrix and Baudrillard's critique of it. Baudrillard sees very clearly what the main issue is with the Matrix film, with its underlying assumption. And as he sees it so clearly, let's say, he also sees a way out. 
Now, according to Baudrillard, the Matrix film rests on one highly problematic assumption, that there is still a clear distinction between Matrix, that is the simulation, and the real. It is always clear where Neo and the other protagonists are in the film. Are they in the Matrix or are they outside the Matrix? Baudrillard, however, is convinced that we can no longer make that distinction. The certainty of the Matrix films is still Cartesian, but the true condition of the postmodern age is the collapse of any such certainty. In fact, there is a collision between the simulation and the real, that is, the hyperreal. What would be interesting, Baudrillard said, is to show what happens when these two worlds collide. Now, in this interview on the Matrix film, Baudrillard also says the following, which is critical. The most embarrassing part of the film is that the new problem posed by simulation is confused with its classical platonic treatment. This is a serious flaw. So again, just to point this out briefly, what the film does is to assume the two-world paradigm, the world of mere appearance, appearance of illusion, let's say, and the true world. Baudrillard here continues. The radical illusion of the world is a problem faced by all great cultures, which they have solved through art and symbolization. What we have invented in order to support this suffering is a simulated real, which henceforth supplants the real and is its final solution. A virtual universe from which everything dangerous and negative has been expelled. And the matrix is undeniably part of that. Everything belonging to the order of dream, utopia and phantasm is given expression, realized. We are in the uncut transparency. So inadvertently then the matrix reveals the truth of this our time and hence also the way out. In fact, I would go as far as saying that in this cut from uh, negativity, of course, there's the very real threat and also reality of any critique being almost made impossible. But at the same time, this absolutization of the positive or the negative that's uh, dialectically solved for in the simulated positivity is going to come back to haunt the simulation. So let me also briefly point out then that what Baudrillard here addresses as the classical platonic treatment is not to be conflated with Plato's cave. Anyone who will make the claim that Plato's cave is really here in the background and Plato's so-called theory of forms has not understood Plato. So the classic humanist reading of Plato would indeed have it that there is a clear distinction between appearances or let's say illusions and forms. But any close reading to the cave myth will show that the distinction was never clear and concise. In fact, when the freed prisoner leaves the cave, he does not leave behind the world and enters a new world. It is still the same realm. Plato even goes as far as saying that the philosopher kings rule through their superior knowledge and understanding of the shadows. The myth of the case does consequently not end outside the cave, but inside the cave. And it necessarily does so. There is not in Plato a two-world paradigm. The realm of forms participates in the appearances. There is no ideal world imagined as perfect at all. And here we would have to get into a genuine philosophy of language and how the particular participates in the universal and how the universal participates in the, in the particular through language. And this is precisely what the post-structuralists uh, do not understand in their sophistic, very old and frankly very trite uh, and kind of banal attacks on language. Uh, they are as old as philosophy, as I said before, so they're not as radical and avant-garde uh, as they, uh, of course, deemed themselves. But Baudrillard himself, uh, you know, for all his weaknesses, uh, goes beyond, of course, uh, that. So he does understand 
that there is a threat in Platonism, not maybe in Plato, but in Platonism. And he does also understand that in our technological time, we really have instantiated technology, uh, through technology, uh, Plato's or a Platonistic theory of forms. One must understand that the more a system nears perfection, Baudrillard continues, the more it approaches the total accident. The system, the virtual, the matrix, all of these will perhaps return to the dustbin of history. For reversibility, challenge and seduction are indestructible. So this is crucial. Baudrillard does not absolutize the matrix. He does not absolutize the simulacrum. He does not absolutize the simulation. Anyone who absolutizes, for example, the simulation or simulacra or genuine pretending, etc., is ultimately just reveals himself as a sophist and is also not true to form because at any moment the simulation is called out. It can still be named, can it not? Even just the question, is this real, is still possible to be asked. Uh, and even that question itself discloses something other and more um, than just take a, an, an immediate acceptance or taking in of what is supposedly real or not real. Uh, and so what this allows for this question, and as long as the questions are possible, is already a break in the simulation. Every time language is uttered, every time we speak, we break the seemingly absolute power of language. Hence, language that is perfectly structured and grammatical and perfectly coherent is dead and sterile and boring. And it is only when we speak, it's especially a language that is spoken that is perhaps not absolutely perfect, where we find, where we can hear more truth. There is something truly peculiar and strange about our age that we seemingly cannot discern what is real or true. That, for example, on wh whosoever side one is on, what we see in the same image may completely differ. It is a perspectival age. And even though we have a, at least supposedly or potentially, the capacity to record everything in real time, it is still perspectival. We cannot capture the whole. But this in itself, as Baudrillard himself says, already indicates the weakness of the matrix and of the hyperreal and of the simulation. Now our age is in fact or sees the collapse of the metaphysical dimension into the technological coordinate system. Attempts for example to solve a supposed meta-crisis betray merely a technocratic response to the issue. The abundance of images, of now AI-generated images, and we should think of it as artificial limitation, of things that have no original, that, repre that represent nothing, and still mediate the world do to us and will do so increasingly. The perfect non-world of the simulacrum seems upon us inevitably. Baudrillard writes, something has disappeared. The sovereign difference between one and the other that constituted the charm of abstraction. It is all of metaphysics that is lost. No more mirror of being and appearances of the real and its concept. What is being produced by AI in image and written word is simulation of imitation and pastiche. The products are simulacra, copies of copies, without origin. Yet, it is still a rehashing of human creation, in fact, of the entirety of recorded history in whose meaning particles many will drown and utterly be confused. It will be like no other hell ever imagined. Though perhaps the notion of origin here too rests on the Platonistic two-world paradigm. Perhaps the origin was never a presumed eternal form but always already only in the enactment of the form. 
Baudrillard himself points to the prohibition of icons and idols in monotheism. He writes, This is precisely what was feared by iconoclasts, whose millennial quarrel is still with us today. This is precisely because they predicted this omnipotence of simulacra, the faculty simulacra half of effacing God from the conscience of man and the destructive annihilating truth they allowed to appear. That deep down God never existed. That only the simulacrum ever existed. Even that God himself was never anything but his own simulacrum. From this came their urge to destroy the images. It may then very well be that it is through simulacra and simulation that another way opens itself, one beyond paranoid monotheism, which, according to Baudrillard, is at the core of all of this. <laughs>